Welcome. I'm Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. This TV series explores a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. Throughout our nation's history, the best political and social changes have been organized through grassroots movements. In the modern era, too, if we are to make progress on the issues that we care about, peace, social justice, a humane economy, environmental stewardship, and so forth, we must learn how to strategize, organize, and build effective grassroots movements. Most of what people think about as activism falls far short of what we really need. A lot of activist organizations just protest against the bad things without ever devising a bold and attractive vision for the future. It's not enough to be reactive, we have to be proactive. Political parties and a lot of nonprofit organizations are tied to what is, quote, politically feasible, unquote, at the current time and in the current political climate, rather than propose a bold vision and change our culture and change our political climate. We can do that only by creating grassroots movements that devise bold goals and smart strategies. A lot of activists just simply repeat the same tactics over and over and over without clear goals and overall strategies for reaching those goals. Most of us sign email petitions through mouse click activism that is far less than what the world really needs from us. That does not apply real pressure. We need to actually build power at the grassroots. Our greatest leverage to change things is rooted in real people in local communities. Grassroots movements need to develop capacity and skills and strategies. We need to expand alliances and build a national network of community-based movements. Autonomous local actions could be informed by a framework of shared goals, strategies, and principles. So this month's TV program will provide fresh insights and will stimulate creative strategies for grassroots action. To do this, we have just an outstanding guest. I'm happy to welcome Bill Moyer, who thinks strategically and creatively about how to organize grassroots movements for real democracy and who therefore has achieved a lot. He works with the Backbone Campaign, which is based on Vashon Island in Washington State. Welcome, Bill. Good to oh, have you here. It's really great to be here. I'm honored. Oh, it's, it'll be fun. Um, the introduction that I just provided uh, summarized some of the context for the TV program, and these are points that you and I have been making over the years as we work on these kinds of things. Uh, and I wonder, what else can you tell our viewers about the shortcomings of current efforts to make change? Mm. Well, I think first I would like to start by saying that uh, 
that these ideas, both that you're sharing and that I, I want to share, are ideas that we've collected from folks who are doing great work and who've been doing great work. So just, I, I don't, <clears throat> I'm excited to be able to reflect the learnings, uh, the lessons from a lot of different people tonight, but I, I'm not Mr. Answer Man. Um, that, that said, I, I think that you, you hit on a number of the problems. I feel like we've been in a trance in this relationship with our computers and our, um, the mouse click activism or clicktivism as some people call it. We've, the computer, I think, has also played a role in making us uh, armchair political pundits and thinking we should be doing the political calculus. It's taken us away from the uh, the person-to-person -person activism and organizing that, are, that is in the, deeply within the tradition of so, our social change tradition that we come from. And uh, I'd like to quote my buddy Kyle Tanner. You know, if, if this last year was the year of the activist, uh, it would be great if next year was the year of the organizer. Oof, there we go. Um, historically, you know, grassroots organizing has really accomplished some great results. Can you mention something of this historical context that we're going to build upon? Well, uh, I'm a big fan of, and and we've spoken about this, of the, the populist movement in the 1890s, and I read Lawrence Goodwin's The Populist Moment. And at the risk of being repetitive, I, I feel like we are again in a populist moment. One of the key lessons from that book is, the, is that when organizers went into the community, they went in not with just pushing their disconnected issue. They went into the community and they solved a problem. They help uh, farmers uh, create a cooperative storage and marketing of grains. Simultaneously, they did political education. And, and it, eventually, we got this thing, they got this thing called the Omaha Platform. And they built power by both having a movement that made a material difference in people's lives and delivering a, a, an analysis or a, a, a political education in an organic way that flowed out till at their height they had 44,000 lecturers leading these meetings around the country. So I, I think that for me that's a particularly poignant example because I think that so many times we get caught up in the ideal of the vision, the world peace idea, or um, and we forget to figure out how do we get from the power we need for the power we have to the power we need right. to achieve that vision. Right. Well, I, there, there really has been that, that good historical track record of success. You know, the labor movement, the environmental movement, the women's right to vote, and a bunch of these things, civil rights and everything else. Um, I want to celebrate briefly a local thing that you had worked on at, mm. on Maury Island, which yeah. is in the, the Puget Sound area. Um, you won a victory when you stopped a gravel mine, and the experience that you had there is a concrete example that these things really are winnable. And the, you'll show us some, some uh, news clips yeah. that, will, that you can uh, help, help us see some things that we'll be talking about during the, this hour. Yeah, show I, us these clips and tell us what's going on here. Yeah, what's fascinating is that I got brought into this inadvertently. I didn't know that I, Backbone Campaign had always done national issues but by engaging in the local, there was this incredible lesson that the collusion between corporate power and elected power and our capacity to leverage the media and our political power was much more concentrated locally than it was nationally. And so in, in delivering victory is a fun thing to do. It's mm -hmm. more fun to win. All right, so this is the very beginning. After 10 years of struggle, another background thing is that one of the fascinating parts about this is people have been fighting in the legislature, they're fighting in the courts, et cetera, for a while. They even tried to buy the land. And at one point they said, oh, it was $115 million if you want to buy the land. They never had a grassroots direct action campaign flank. And all of those flanks are important, but without a direct action campaign flank, they were losing. Brought dozens of people to Maury Island this morning. They gathered on land and at sea near Sandy Shores Beach. At issue is a dock for an expanded gravel mine on the eastern rim of the island. 
Glacier Northwest crews began laying booms in the water last Friday following one of the longest environmental battles in the island's history. The steel dock, when it's done, will be 305 feet long and will go right over a state-owned aquatic reserve. All right, so that's a, that's a um, pretty short clip, but we tricked the media into covering us by putting a, a lo that large sign along the beach. Yeah. And we did it at 7.30 in the morning so that the traffic helicopters that would be up in the air anyway w along the I-5 corridor between Tacoma and, uh, and Seattle could just fly over and, and get a great shot. Okay. Well, we only had 50 people on the beach. Well, so after that, we did a nonviolent direct action training. And I'll skip a video that, where we got some coverage where we blockaded two roads into the mine site. <clears throat> and, and then two days later went and had a, um, a, a march on the beach. So, but here, this is a month from that original clip. All of a sudden. It is fast becoming the poster child for the fight to, it is fast becoming the poster, poster child for the fight to save Puget Sound, a contaminated gravel mine set to reopen in southern Vashon community of Maury Island. But for the second time in a week, workers are being met by protesters who vow to keep the mine closed. King 5's Eric Wilkinson reports. By land and by sea, about 500 protesters descend upon the Glacier Northwest gravel site on Maury Island. It's not a local issue. Our entire Puget Sound is at stake. We have to take care of it. It's a battle that's raged for a decade, but Glacier now has the proper permits and a lease to build the dock that would reopen and expand the mine. Opponents say the expansion would threaten an aquatic reserve, marine life, and the island water supply with arsenic from the now defunct Asarco smelter. They proposed to dig up acres of contaminated soil and make a huge three-story high berm right above your drinking water at the top of this hill. Islanders are vowing to continue to fight this mine, both politically and the... Just keep moving here. Okay. But uh, so the f we went from 50 people on the beach to 500 people on the beach in a matter of a month. But it was because the people in the community were attached to this issue. We weren't talking about some abstraction for them. Mm -hmm. um, and the... One of the things that ha happened from the very first video to this is in a month's time, we went from being a very isolated group of individuals to being a community defining the fight to save Puget Sound. And part of what we'll talk about later is the idea of motherhood and mismatch. We had a motherhood cause um, that couldn't be attacked. We we're defending the sound. It wasn't just about somebody's property values. And so here are some of the images of us out there. We scrambled kayaks into the construction zone for uh, two different days. We had to tie up the, the pile driver. Um, we got additional media coverage for that. Um, there were some folks underneath the welding baskets. And after that, 500 people on the beach, we, our, our crew, um, who'd been asking for a, del a meeting with the governor's office, actually got one after a lot of calls and not getting returned. By demonstrating our power in the community, we got the we got a, a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. uh, th this is interesting because they had the company had to stop mining for about six months, so there would was a possibility that we would disappear. But I made sure that the governor's office knew that we weren't disappearing, and, and in fact, I took a lesson from uh, from Abby Hoffman, who I got to have beer with one time. <laughs> he he said to me, "If you want a seat at the table." you've got to create an 800-pound gorilla that they do not want to have to deal with. So we still didn't have fully an 800-pound gorilla, so I said to them that, you know, we're bringing in the trainers who prepared people for the WTO and to Vashon because we want our community to be ready because you, you should not doubt our resolve. That thing, that mine dot construction is not going to reopen, not going to restart. And, um, and also the real solution to this is finding a way to buy that land. So simultaneously, there was actually a, 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 a negotiation around the price of the purchase of the land. Of course, the price, we wanted to make, break that price mm -hmm. down. So here's a little bit about our 800 pound gorilla. Being on a quiet island, Puget Sound activists have gone into training to push civil disobedience to the limit. All this over a Maury Island gravel mine, some say threatens the ecosystem of Puget Sound. King 5's Chris Daniels reports from nearby Vashon, which today became a training ground. 
It looks like any ordinary summer camp. There are outdoor activities, crafts, We're gonna go through some basic stuff in and water car. sports. Let's get your PFT. But this camp on Vashon Island has a twist. We're here because our, we want to save Maury Island from turning into an industrial gravel mine. This group of people, young and old, are looking to raise a ruckus if a local company continues to try and expand a Maury Island gravel mine. These activists argue doing so would damage sensitive eelgrass beds, plus hurt the native salmon and orca right. populations. The training could lead to an organized effort to try and stop it. This is the Maury Island Aquatic Reserve, central of Puget Sound. It's the pivot point for saving Puget Sound. So we're completely committed to uh, principled, nonviolent direct action. The preparations come even though the state this lands the commissioner question. just made a ruling last week. So the, um, what happened here is that, and what's next in this news clip is that they start to talk with Peter Goldmark who we had given as a community great elbow room for to to stand and, out before the and, island. And he's the head of the Department of Natural Resources. Pardon me, yes, he's public. the, uh, the so commission. The statewide elected official. Yes, and one of the things we, you know, that's clear in preserving the land, et cetera, is that you can't do it with coercion. You need credibility because you need voluntary compliance. And what was it, th what we wanted to make sure was clear is that what's really at threat by turning this place in the middle of Puget Sound into a, an industrial gravel mine was that how are you going to ask Joe and Susie down the beach to put to fix their septic if you're going to allow a, a transnational gravel mine to move two to three to seven million tons a year for 25 years through an aquatic reserve? It just doesn't make any sense. So uh, it turned out that that Commissioner Goldmarks uh, went beyond really. He stretched the limits of his authority, and uh, his opinion of that sometimes you just have to say no got read into a court record. And then finally, so there was a legal victory. The legal victory came down right as we prepared to, um, uh, with, to have our 800-pound gorilla hit the water, 40 kayaks to blockade the incoming construction barge. So that was a temporary victory, sent the company back to a scoping process, etc., kept the land price going down, and uh, made everybody feel excited, but the, the work wasn't done. But it was mostly done, because we had shifted the variables in the political calculus. We had shifted the political equation about what was viable. Could the governor seriously allow this to happen on her watch, and to have the community be the, uh, the steward of Puget Sound when she had said that she was going to be the steward of Puget Sound, you know, that was a priority for her. Could you alienate librarians and school teachers, et cetera, who are going to help you keep your aquatic reserve program intact by allowing an industrial gravel mine? Could you, all of a sudden, the community was leading and the politicians were following, mm -hmm. which is always the case. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just play the beginning of this video, and this is just the beginning of the... Ten years of arguments, yeah. protests, and legal battles over a small section of a Puget Sound island may have come to a surprising conclusion today. As our environmental specialist Gary Chittam shows us, opponents of a mining operation on Maury Island near Vashon have decided if you can't beat them, buy them out. This old mine site on Maury Island is a well-known feature of Puget Sound. For the last ten years, it's been a battleground, pitting local residents, groups, and agencies against a multinational corporation with thoughts to resume mining. It's not a local issue. Our entire Puget Sound is at stake. A decade of dispute buried the site under a dark legal cloud. Today, the sun came out. This is indeed a glorious afternoon. State and county agencies, local groups, and Maury Island residents gathered to celebrate a land deal, a patchwork of funding to buy. Everybody has bought into the idea that they have to make this problem go away. And, um, and so, yes, they find Instead of $115 million to buy this land, it's $36 million. And there's money from the Asarco settlement, et cetera, to do the purchase of the land. Uh, it, was a, it was a great victory for the, our community. And I think it's a great example of, of building a campaign with, with a variety of tactics, having multiple flanks that are complementary. Mm -hmm. and, then, and now that, more, that part of Maury Island is going to be a park. Mm -hmm. well, that's a great victory, and it's local. Yep. 
And and I appreciate the strategy and, and the, the care with which you kind of shaped this campaign and then shepherded the thing along. Uh, one of the things I think that you mentioned just uh, earlier here in this interview was, was about getting power. And um, you've got some insights into how to do that. And we'll talk some more about this mm -hmm. later. But we, we should not be afraid to talk about how we get power and how we use it. And, and, and um, I, yeah. it's just, yeah. you did a great job yeah. of making the politicians respond to us rather than uh, just pleading with them to please do the right thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a whole shift. It's a very different shift. And a lot of people don't feel comfortable. A lot of people because feel that conflict is bad and power is bad. But power is not bad and we're in a conflict. So if you don't right. recognize it, you're, you're going to get, you're going to lose. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, when I introduced the program here, I, I mentioned that a lot of people just do the same tactics over and over and over again without having a, a real strategic plan. And you emphasize having a, a, a good vision, a clear vision, and then goals, and then strategy, and then finally tactics. And that sequence uh, is important. Uh, tell us uh, about that sequence and why that matters. Well, I think that, <clears throat> um, that if we don't know where we're going, we certainly aren't going to be likely to know it when we get there or know the way there. Um, I don't want to exaggerate the amount that we can know ahead of time because I think that there's an, as an aspect of things evolving as well. But <clears throat> for me personally, what's evolving also in my mind is that, that maybe our vision, for instance, is a, not just a constitutional amendment in a property rights-based social contract in a democracy, what about it? Maybe our my for me that seems to me like what we're talking about is a social contract built on human rights, based on human rights. Well, how on earth do we get to such a thing? Do we call for a constitutional convention? That's a little scary. Although I'm believing more and more that maybe we have the potential to call for such a thing, but there are probably a lot of building blocks of building the power so that we can actually be ready to call for a constitutional convention. We don't even have the power yet to amend the Constitution. So how do we start getting the power to do that? So what are these, how do we take advantage of this populist moment? Things like the principal reduction for the 30% of American homes that are, under, are underwater. Um, how about debt jubilee for students for the trillion dollars worth of debt, debt that's weighing down on young mm -hmm. people around the country. So <clears throat> in a very grand scheme, I would I think of those as milestones or, or goals. As much as it's important to have strategies for each, reaching each of those goals, I think it's and it's very important to not confuse tactics with a strategy. Mm -hmm. I think that for me personally, um, what I'm learning is that it's as important to understand the principles of grand strategy so that we understand that as we move towards achieving our goals and the purpose of strategies, that we have a way of analyzing whether we're making progress or not. And that's what um, my mentor, Chuck Spinney, from former Pentagon analyst, um, has instructed me on. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned that we need to build from the power that we have to the power that we need. And you, you've alluded to that already. Is there anything else you want to say on that? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> a, a few things. I, I mean, this is usually I preface the talk about grand strategy with some of our obstacles, uh, misunderstandings, and confusion uh, that seem to be a, a part of what's in our movement. And, um, and one is this hierarchy of these ideas, mm -hmm. that vision, mm -hmm. goals, t strategy, tactics, tactics serve strategy, strategy serve goals, goals serve vision. But in building power and building from the power we have to the power we need, <clears throat> and I say this you know, lovingly, is that I don't think that pissing in the wind for world peace is actually going to get us closer to world peace. I feel like we have to have a movement that's smart enough to make steps along the way. And part of the confusion is sometimes that armchair pundit st aspect of what we've been in... Um, 
intoxicated with, via, possibly via the computer, et cetera, and also by being, participating in, in a lot of political party stuff, mm -hmm. is, um, is we forget that, that calculus is actually the mathematics of changing variables. Mm -hmm. And that it's the politicians and the lawyers who are sticking their finger in the wind. And it's their job to like, punch the, 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 the keys on the calculus to try to do the math. Mm -hmm. But if we think that that's our job, and sure, a lot of these Beltway organizations s seem to be communicating to us that, oh, we just have to get this many votes in the Senate, blah, blah, blah. And we forget that community power is, bu is built and our, we change variables locally. <clears throat> and the job of organizers and activists is to change the social political variables. Mm -hmm. And it's by doing that that we change the political calculus. Mm -hmm. um, and that's hopefully what happened in, um, uh, well, that's certainly in my mind what happened on Maury Island. Right. And we want, let's talk about the grand strategy because you, you have a concept of grand strategy that is very helpful. Tell yeah. us how I, that works. Thank you. Because it, just as much as, we, there's no blueprint. Like, grand strategy is not it, it, something you can just take and then put onto your campaign. It's a set of principles. It's the idea that, and this is as old as Sun Tzu and the art of war. Uh, it's, it's the idea that the first principle of grand strategy is that we need to expand alliances. We need to increase the internal cohesion of the people, of the people within those alliances. And we have to deepen the resolve of our own people. Right. So for an example, when uh, some years ago, um, I was involved with a relative handful of people who were organizing opposition to uh, have the to let the county float a, over a hundred million dollars worth of bonds to build a gigantic, just a gigantic new county jail. Right. And and so I would ask the, our organizing committee, well, who else besides this handful of us cares about this? Who else uh, would would you know would have their interests involved? And, and is more than you would think. I mean, there are people who care about mental health issues right. because they have somebody in the family who has a mental health problem. Well, a jail is basically a place where people who have mental illnesses get lodged but without any real treatment. Mm. So you've got allies there. Right. Floating these bonds would have been a humongous uh, debt load. Mm. And then when the school district needs to raise money for a bond level, the taxpayers would say, geez, I'm already overtaxed because of this jail thing, I'm going to have to start voting no on schools for the next however many years. Right. So people in schools, people who care about schools, would be allies. And on and on, there, there's just a whole range of people who are potential allies. And when all these folks get together, besides people who just don't want to waste money on big government programs sure. that don't work, and, and on and on and on. So there, there were a lot of people who had various ways of agreeing with us that that humongous jail should not be built. As it turned out, they scaled it back, built a, a, a jail that was like a, a fraction of that size, and they can't even afford to, to staff that. So it's sitting there vacant. Right. And this is after several so, years. So clearly, no matter which campaign, what, what, we're work, what struggle we're within, by expanding alliances, we, we strengthen our power. Um, so when we engage in tactics, um, we can think about, is this tactic going to strengthen our alliance? Is it going to deepen cohesion? Mm -hmm. Are we integrating ritual or celebration in, into the work that we're doing to affirm the work that, 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 that people are engaged in work that is, um, that is consonant with their deepest beliefs? Mm -hmm. and, and that <clears throat> comes down to this idea that we, around the political calculus piece, that we do not need to sacrifice principle to build power. On the contrary... If we understand that we are in a conflict, and we'll get to this, mm -hmm. our power is by, exists only by staying consistent with principles. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Yeah. The other part of, uh, of grand strategy, though, is this, it's not just about just expanding our alliances, et cetera. It's about undermining the alliances of our opponent. It's about increase, decreasing their internal cohesion and weakening their resolve. So instilling doubt driving wedges, bringing people who maybe weren't the obvious allies, but <clears throat> are in, in our spectrum of allies, are, um, are passive opponents. Maybe they're not obvious opponents and they're not obvious allies, but 
let's make them neutral, and at mm -hmm. least they're not fighting against us. And let's make the neutral people at least passive allies, mm -hmm. and let's make the passive allies active allies. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say that the last principle of, of grand strategy is to win without sowing the seeds of future conflict. Yeah, yeah, right. And I think that's really important and a hard lesson for those of us in the Northwest. And a very interesting, you know, I celebrate <clears throat> that, that we all feel a sense of relief that gay marriage now is legal in Washington State. But this is an interesting, uh, 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 interesting struggle because, <clears throat> for me personally, I feel like if we really wanted to end that without sowing the seeds of future conflict, I think we would have gone a slightly different route. I think we would have um, made civil separation, made it a separation of church and state issue, and provided civil unions for all, and taken the secular and the sacred uh, language apart to make it less confusing. <clears throat> so then we aren't just loading the teeter-totter of mm -hmm. fundraising to fund a campaign against mm -hmm. gay marriage. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm hoping that our society is beyond that, but it is an issue that yeah. I think is interesting. <clears throat> so, can we talk about yeah. the yeah. conflict? Yeah, we're, we're running a bit late, so I, I know there's a lot yeah. more good content to do. So, But uh, I know you, you've got some information about tactical and strategic domains of conflict that has some rich yeah. content. If we can uh, Go, let's buzz through that. summarize it. Okay. Um, so the um, domains of conflict is a, a study, uh, it comes from the study of warfare. So attrition warfare, if you think about the British and the French coming up against each other and, you know, blah, until one person standing with the flag and that side wins, that assumes um, a symmetrical power relationship. Mm -hmm. We're in an asymmetrical power relationship. Our, um, so attrition, it's all about brute force, destruction, compulsion, body counts, etc. There is, they call it in the Pentagon, the physical game. Maneuver conflict is, um, is about a mental game. And sometimes we can, we can win in elements of that. Uh, we can go into a Bank of America with a flash mob and have way too many people and the security doesn't know what to deal with us, do with us. But most of the time, we're in the realm of moral conflict. And in moral conflict, it's the principle that we stay true to that wins our, the people. Because mm -hmm. our power lies really with the people. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the importance of not falling into the political calculus. And it's about, um, there's an idea that's really important in moral conflict. And it's the idea of motherhood and mismatch. The idea that we want our cause to be the moral equivalency of motherhood. Because it's like the kids say, I'm a mirror, you're glue, I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say balances off me and sticks to you. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with motherhood. Mm -hmm. We want democracy, community, dignity part of, be part of identity. Mm -hmm. Protecting um, the Puget Sound was our motherhood concept. Yeah. The, 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 the activist, uh, the other activist named Bill Moyer, who uh, we actually had on our TV program uh, twice in, yeah. in many years ago. Uh, he, he was based in Philadelphia and then in San Francisco and did a lot of this work. And he emphasized this in his movement action plan and his other writings where he said, we have to be so grounded in the widely held social values and be able to show the general public whom we're trying to win over that we are doing a better job of upholding those values than the people who have the official power and who are violating those values. So we need to set up that contrast that says we're on the side of these good values that the public widely holds and deeply holds, and the people who have the official wealth, political power, whatever, are violating those. That's right. You make that really clear and the public will say, oh yeah, I can see it, I've got to align myself with you now. Right, and if you cloud that with things like fighting, thinking your battle is to fight with the police, or thinking that your battle yeah. is about creating your own, the most being the most radical, and you're and you're 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 looking for your radical identity to your right and to your left, and guiding yeah. that way, and you forget that the, the yeah. idea that the whole world is watching means that the whole world is watching you. Yeah, and we we move into we start to create a, a dissonance, um, lack of connection between the right. principles we say we're standing for and what we're yeah. actually standing yeah. for. Yeah, I keep asking you know how will this bring more people into mm. the movement yes is what you're talking about doing going to bring more middle of the road undecided people to our side or is it going to frighten them away 
That's right. And it, it, it's by having those identity that people can <laughs> are sympathize with and identify with. Yeah, yeah. And then what we want to also do, the other side of that coin, is that we want to attack the, there's a triangle, so the mismatch triangle, that, um, that where we want to attack the difference between what our opponents say they are mm -hmm. and what they're real, who they really right. are. Right. What they say they're doing, what they're actually doing, what they say is real and what is actually real. Right. And there's a great article by my mentor um, called How Obama Won on the, the concept of motherhood and mismatch that I hope people can check out. Okay. Once we have a strategic understanding, once we share a strategic framework, we can harmonize autonomous actions all over the country. Um, and, and we can start acting in, um, in harmony with those principles and in harmony with one another. And the, the, the trick is, is that we have to be able to deploy a variety of tactics as quickly as possible. There's, an, uh, there's something on the, um, from the Pentagon called the OODA loop mm -hmm. that we are in a process of observing, orienting, figuring out where we are in reality, deciding what action we're going to take, and then taking the action. And it goes around and around. The faster we can do this, if we can be at a tempo where our opponents are, are unable to keep up, they don't get to observe and orient before they have to take another action, then all of a sudden they become confused and they start making mistakes. Mm -hmm. And then we start to get the advantage or we get inside their OODA loop is what people call it. Now, of course, an OODA loop is very complicated, really. It's not as simple as that first sketch. And we're not, obviously you can't see this on the screen. But it, an OODA loop is influenced by our obsessions and, uh, and background, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But what we're striving for ultimately is variety in our mm -hmm. tactics, adaptability, agility, mm -hmm. rapidity, initiative, and harmony. But you always have to stay grounded in those values, in the, in the, the, uh, the, the principles, uh, so that uh, we're being true to who we are. And if, we, if the other side can get thrown off balance, uh, then, then we have the moral high ground. That's right. And, and uh, so we can, we can be adaptable and agile and rapid and so forth, but we have to stay grounded in the real principles and not veer off into uh, stuff that ends up being counterproductive. That's right, that's right. And, yeah. and, we, and we, we can, if we have an understanding of the strategic principles, the grand strategic principles, we can assess as we go. We also have to, luckily we have the internet, we have internet, it's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. We can be collecting information, that's called our intelligence, right? Lots of subjective perspectives filtered through to find out what is, when we're orienting ourselves, mm -hmm. what is real? Yeah, we, we talked a bit about the spectrum of allies and there's a, uh, if you can move on to the next slide that has a, uh, a visual representation of what you talked about before. Can you just summarize that point uh, right. briefly and then uh, we'll move on because we're running yeah. a bit tight. But this was what you said before where people are at various places along the spectrum. Right. Some active and some passive and, we and can some middle of the road. Yeah, and we can design our tactics that are going to pull people yeah. to here, to here. And then in, the, right. in a, the escalation of our campaign, we hopefully are, are celebrating a larger and larger alliance. Yeah, I've, I've used this in the past, and I, I tell folks, try to move people one notch further in our direction. <clears throat> and so that might mean that we have to use a different message or different methods to reach out to people who oppose us actively and just make them be not so active in opposing us. Yeah. Um, and that would be a different message and different methods than we would use to reach out to the middle of the road people who are undecided and try to move them toward tilting our way. Yeah. But don't expect that you're gonna take the opponent, the hardcore opponent, and convert them magically to all yeah. the way over to our side. That's not gonna happen. No. So, but if we can design strategies to move people one notch our way, right. uh, that, that helps. Right, so when I talk about creative tactics, what I'm trying to do is how do we create greater agility and, and ver variety in our tactics? What do we mean by creative tactics? Mm -hmm. Well, the use of metaphor or spectacle, mm -hmm. the size, story, connecting the personal to the, to the political or, or uh, real life stories to make people identify with the cause, yeah. meta stories, like the idea that 
that people who are progressive are weak need or or a bleeding heart is a kind of a combination of the backbone campaigns trying to retell that story using the metaphor, another biological metaphor, and and tell a story that we're you know we're strong principal progressives and we have the leaders and ideas to run the country. One of the key elements of like sowing cohesion is ritual. Ridicule and praise are very fun uh, components, but ridicule has to be used carefully because we don't want to create sympathy for our opponent, and so we might infuse our ridicule with some humor mm -hmm. in order to, um, uh, it, you know, ridicule really needs beauty or humor to, uh, to, to keep it from uh, having a, a backfiring effect on us. Yeah. So I'm going to move through some of these other yeah. ideas so we could skip the slides and, um, and just uh, maybe we, I could show a few pictures of other a variety yeah. of tactics. I, I want, want to see if we can take all these things that you've talked about and apply them to a couple of uh, to one or more specific uh, issues or campaign kinds of things that, that you might, you know, that our viewers would care about, such as the peace movement. You know, what advice would you offer in light of all this for the peace movement? or for the Occupy movement, or for the movement to uh, reform the way we finance and conduct our elections. Do you want to pick? Yeah, well, huh. I, I see them all as related. Uh -huh. um, I, see, I, I, see, I feel that um, <clears throat> the peace movement um, is holding this moral vision, and, and that's great, but it needs to be in alliance with uh, economic justice, which I think it mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. and, and, and I, I just th I think that and, and with the Occupy movement, I think the Occupy movement needs to make sure that it's holding on to an identity that's principles-based, that is uh, relatable, uh, that people understand. And then it moves, it was understandable that it didn't want to be co-opted, but it needed to maintain an identity at first. Now it needs to kind of move, I think, into an organizing mode and make sure that people understand that it can make a real difference in their lives. And so I think it needs to evolve into, uh, like I'm, I favor the idea of the occupies uh, getting into the eviction protection and supporting the growth of that movement mm -hmm. so we can build nodes of political power in communities, resist or fight the banks, actually help people, mm -hmm. do, take on an issue that affects basically all of the country. Yeah. Well, home ownership is a basic American value. It's as American Every, as yeah, apple pie. It's your own castle. I mean, this is something, and if, if the Occupy movement and other progressives could, could help people protect their homes from, from foreclosure by predatory banks, right. that's, that's as American as apple pie. Absolutely, and the negative yeah. equity in the country is $715 billion. The sweetheart deal they just did prior to Valentine's Day was for you know twenty some billion dollars over a number of years. The banks just gave bonuses of about hundred and twenty billion dollars to the you know executives. Mm -hmm. um, it's this thing is a drop in the bucket. So we need to I think turn up the heat mm -hmm. on on the banks. I think I like the rhetoric of breaking up the banks. I think universal principal production is the kind of demand that appeals to a broad amount of people. But I think we need to do it in a way, like Saul Alinsky said, mm -hmm. the, a good tactic is something your people enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, uh, can I show just a few pictures yes, of some tactics yes. that I think are quite enjoyable? Yes. So here's an accountability, uh, uh, a backbone patrol. Now they look silly. They're delivering a spineless citation, but they also look silly. Here's the chain gang out uh -huh. in the ditches of Crawford, Texas, uh -huh. uh, undermining the resolve yeah. of uh, those folks. It's our giant backbone. And using the giant puppet, the spectacle, as a billboard. It's fun. Uh -huh. This is a procession for the future that was reframing, trying to say that, like you were saying at the opening of the show, mm -hmm. we can't just be, it can't just be this boat sucks. It has to be, how are we going to build a better boat? And, and also, we want to make sure that people know that we're not just critiquing, but we're proposing. We're yeah. not just an opposition movement. We're a propositional movement. Creating identity using the symbols of our of our country, using juxtaposition, placing our images behind where you know the press are going to take a picture so that it can end up on the front page of the paper. Yeah. Um, taking over the spaces like this is a Lincoln Memorial. Juxtaposing imagery and getting creative and even somewhat technical. This is an eight foot weather balloon lifting a banner made out of deer fence, and we're not even trespassing. It's just juxtaposed with Detroit. Uh, trash incinerator. These are people standing on the sidewalk with 
Tyvek glued onto fa fabric from the garden. Um, Non-arrestable high visibility. This is a few months later, uh, a permitted, taking an image that continues to live on mm -hmm. are here in Washington. Again, with the weather balloons. I'm just gonna scroll through these things. This is that activist scrabble idea. So you can make these tools and then reuse them. Um, so just by mixing the letters. Parades, celebration, this is in Baltimore. Puppets, bands, music. De oh, and what they did is they declared this, the Inner Harbor a human rights zone. They're reframing what they're up to. Here's our March on the Beach on Vashon. It's a tactic we use for freeway bannering, safe, legal, high visibility, low impact, I mean, low cost. This is a Crawford Coal, uh, not Crawford, this is the Valmont Coal in Boulder, Colorado. Reframing the message, it's not just coal is bad, but what we're demanding is renewables now. Mm -hmm. Using light projection by renting a spotlight. Um, where's the money? Tax to 1%. This is on a, then we go to Bellevue and we project it onto a giant uh, uh, Camper Freeman building. This is off a projection at the um, US Supreme Court. We put a dislike button on the, um, uh, the US Chamber of Commerce. So those are just some examples of, I think, creative tactics that are fun to do. Uh-huh, yeah. I, I want to uh, put in a, a plug also for uh, the, the, some work that, that the other Bill Moyer had Please. done. Uh, his movement action plan is just a brilliant um, overall sense of how to build a, a, a long-term campaign, yeah. a movement, from the starting point where hardly anybody knows the problem exists. You know, think of like uh, genetically engineered food before anybody knew that that was happening or starting mm -hmm. up to, you know, up through the, the various stages until you get majority public opinion and you can actually force a change in the laws, the policies, the whatever. But, and he, he has a brilliant way, I think, of showing how we have to keep reaching out and bringing more people in and what the people who have the official power, the economic power or political power, do to try to uh, diminish us. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's a great thing, and, and I, at so many, in so many ways I see his work and your work uh, uh, very, very uh, congruent and, uh, and compatible. It's, it's I do amazing. Too. It's, it's amazing. It's phenomenal. Um, it's, it's very strange sometimes for me because it's yeah. so similar. Uh -huh. He also talks about the roles that different people play yes. within a movement. Yeah. So you need some people who are like the, the rebel who will get out there and, and do these courageous things. You also need people who are reformers who can make something change in the system. And you need visionaries. You need various kinds of people in various roles, and sometimes people will flex between one role and another. So it's yeah. a it's a great thing. He has a book, Doing Democracy, that came out in early 2002, uh, and that's when we had him on the program, yeah. and he died in uh, October 2002. Uh, but the, the book, Doing Democracy, is around. It's very good. And very good. And Mary Lou Finley, the co-author, is up from in Seattle, Seattle and yeah. teaches at Antioch. I had her on the program, too. Once. Fascinating, yeah. wonderful yeah, person. Great. Yeah, so it's, and, and these are not the only models. I mean, your models are, are useful and effective. His are, and, and other people have good strategic sense of how to do these things. So I encourage people to read and learn from a number of ways. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's just crucial that everything stay nonviolent because when you let go of that, then, then it'll turn off the people that we really need to be reaching, which is mainstream folks who can move us along. Right. And, and strengthen the movement. Um, uh, let's talk for just a bit about the Backbone Campaign, which is the organization that you work with. It's based on Vashon Island, which That's is right. in Puget Sound, sort of off of the Seattle-Tacoma area. Um, and the, the, the material that we've been going through on this program is based largely on, on workshops, uh, trainings you've been doing around artful activism, yeah. which is a great thing. But I know Backbone does other good things. I, keep hearing of you and and uh, tell us something about the, the work of the Backbone campaign and well it started by artists uh, as an affinity group and, and then it, it um, 
evolved. Uh, the first thought we we thought that maybe we could give the Democrats a backbone. So there was a, that was part of our theme early on. Uh -huh. We quickly abandoned that and realized that it's really about movement building. Um, but it, the use of creative tactics, but the smart use of creative tactics, mm -hmm. the strategic use mm -hmm. of creativity um, to build movement power became a theme for us. We uh, we continue to uh, increasingly work with community-based organizations like the Steps Coalition in Biloxi and Gulfport, Mississippi, and workers, uh, United Workers in Baltimore, and uh, the MLK Coalition in in Los Angeles, and Vita, uh, City Life Vita Urbana in Boston, and we're learning from all these folks. We're doing, you know, skills sharing, et cetera. And what's fun is after we go out to do action support or trainings in, around the country, we get to bring everybody back for a summer camp mm -hmm. where we, you know, repel from trees and not everybody repels from trees mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and take kayaks and do water tactics, build art, talk, learn about organizing strategies and grand strategy. And we get to weave that those horizontal relationships amongst, uh, you know, the some of the most dynamic organizers and activists in the country. Mm -hmm. So I just feel I, I'm just hugely honored to mm -hmm. be part of that. And one of the things that I think is interesting frontier for us is the idea of getting a movement more back into organizing and giving organ creating like a model of the community-supported organizer, just like we have mm -hmm. com community-supported agriculture, mm -hmm. have support these folks who come to camp and send them back into their communities to do projects, mm -hmm. to be traditional community organizers with non-traditional tools and uh, with autonomy, but a grounded in a strategic understanding. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, again, expand our alliances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's a lot in this for a lot of folks, a lot of different interest groups and constituencies. I mean, look at how teachers get beat up on and, and public employees and uh, poor people and homeless people. Everybody's getting dumped on in various ways and all these are constituencies that would benefit from this kind of organizing in various ways. They'd have to figure out how, what they need and what their goals are and what strategies, but but the, the, this, this, I want to make sure that the viewers don't think that this is just a marginal thing for like people oh. on the left or people no. in the peace movement. I mean, this is uh, the, the, the kind of organizing you're talking about is something that's relevant to lots and lots of people's everyday lives. Yeah, I think that know. that's why it's so beautiful to put things into the 99% or a human rights framework. Yes. Because everybody is a human, <laughs> yeah. has human rights. Yeah. And we all love the Declaration of Independence was actually a human rights based document. Yeah. The Constitution is not. And yeah. we know that there are going to be obstacles in, to get things that we all care about. And we know that, like, for instance, until we have representative democracy, how on earth are we going to end war, unnecessary right. wars or get right. funding of education? So we have reasons to come together right. for some of these bigger things. Because none, the, none of the progress that we've made uh, decades ago, women's right to vote, environmental movement, labor movement, uh, none of those were gifts from the people on top who said, okay, we're, we're the, the, the men who run the government and we're going to do a, a favor for you gals and we're going to let you vote. It was not that way. No. Giant corporations did not tell their employees, uh, we've got lots and lots of money, we're going to do the workers a favor. We're going to let you form unions and we're going to let you have better wages and weekends and eight hour days and stuff. We're, that's just our, you're a gift from us bosses to you uh, workers. So why that's should we th not the way it happened. No, why should we think that it would happen any differently now? That's right. On, on <laughs> any of the issues that we deal no. with. And yeah. you know that, in a sense, the disillusionment with the Obama administration as the source of change, yeah. and it's, um, it, it, I think, is a seed of the Occupy uh, manifest that populism manifesting um, it through Occupy. It's a healthy disillusionment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's time yeah. for us yeah. to not just occupy space, but to occupy our imagination, right. our authority, and our power. I want to let people know how they contact. Uh, the Backbone Campaign. You have a phone, area code 206-408-8058. Uh, you can email info at backbonecampaign.org and you can visit the website www.backbonecampaign.org. So that's something. Um, 
when we, we, we had a lot of stuff to move through and we've covered a lot of stuff. Yeah. Are there things that, is there anything that, that, that you think that we've missed? Anything else that, did, that we didn't cover enough or that we slipped over entirely? Well, I like the Diane de Prima um, quote that the only war that matters is the war against the imagination because all other wars are subsumed by it. So I think that that's one piece that I would say it's the war against the imagination. We have to help people to see that the, the, in, the status quo is not inevitable. In very concrete ways, I, I, I want to critique this idea that we shouldn't be just talking about moving our money. We should ta be talking about cre creating financial institutions to support our movement and our infrastructure mm -hmm. for our communities and are recycling our wealth back into our communities. We need to think about building that equity, whether it be mortgages or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, the very like esoteric imagination, celebrate the imagination, mm -hmm. and then the very concrete of people's mortgages and transforming our financial mm -hmm. institutions, creating a, a, a parallel alternative to the phantom economy that David Corton talks Great. about. Great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the you're coming down from Vashon Island to Olympia and being a guest on our program. So I want to thank Bill Moyer from the thank Backbone you. Campaign. It's an honor. And I want to thank all the folks who've been watching. Historically, most of the political and social progress in U.S. history was accomplished through nonviolent grassroots movements. Only after these grassroots movements became large and powerful did the people at the top of the political and economic hierarchies accommodate the new realities that the grassroots people had already put in place. Women's right to vote, 70 years elapsed from the first major meeting and the constitutional amendment that guaranteed their right. Gays and lesbians equal rights to marry. People organized vigorously for relatively few years in the historical context, and now several states, including Washington as the seventh state as of February 2012, recognize this basic human right for equality. Serious problems and great opportunities exist throughout the world, in our nation, and in our local communities. Grassroots movements have great potential to solve the problems and advance into the new opportunities. Our efforts will be more successful if we envision the future we want, if we set bold goals, if we plan strategically, and if we use creative, nonviolent tactics. It really is up to us. You can get information about a wide variety of additional issues related to peace, social justice, and nonviolence by contacting the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation at 360-491-9093, www.olympiafor.org. We're one human family, and we all share one planet. We can create a better world, but we all have to work on it. The world needs you. Thank you.